When you are intentional and living authentically in a sense of purpose, like you were, for instance, about football, you know who you are. So you really get that strong sense of identity and purpose and identity lead to connections and community. And that's the magical part. Like, again, we focus on money and did you become that football player in the NFL? No, you didn't. But by living authentically in your purpose, you created community connections and skills. And those things led you do a life where you could continue following that purpose, not maybe the exact same purpose, but that community and connections were actually the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It isn't purpose and it isn't even knowing your identity. The pot of gold really is what flows from that, which is those communities and connections which lead to a full life. In this episode, Jordan Goumet talks about the importance of living life like you're dying. Jordan was a doctor for over 15 years, and he worked with many patients that were on their deathbed. And when patients were living on their deathbed, they never said that, hey, I wish I made more money. They always talk about their, their regrets. They regretted not learning how to play an instrument. They regretted not going on that vacation. They regretted many different things. Hearing these stories, along with a series of other life events, made Jordan realize that he wasn't living in his purpose and that he needs to make some change in his life. Now that Jordan is living a purposeful life, he has freedom of his time, he can do what he wants to do, he sets his schedule. His goal is to share the importance of people living through their purpose because when you chase your purpose, not only does it make you happy, but it improves all different areas of your life. Because through chasing our purpose, we're actually evolving and becoming a better version of ourselves. Now before we start the episode, 98% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. Subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. If you're listening on any of the streaming networks, follow us and give us a five-star review. Anyways, my name is Deron Brown, and this is the podcast Philosophy for Life. So, Jordan, I read your book, and um, I'm just curious, like, why do you care so much about people living their best life? So I love to have the communications and the conversations that help people grow. In fact, I think that's part of my purpose. When I started trying to figure out who I am, when I realized that being a physician was not really the identity that fit for me, I became aware of other parts of my identity that were important. And one of those pieces was this idea of being a communicator. And so you ask why it's important to me that other people live their best life. I think that's part of my purpose is having these conversations that help them live their best life. So Jordan, the reason I asked you that question is because you worked, you worked in the medical field, you worked with people who are dying, you've heard their stories, you've heard their regrets. Now, obviously these stories have touched you in a very deep way. I'm wondering, did anybody's story specifically like make you reflect on your life and make you think like, am I doing what I really want to do? Have I lived my best life? There certainly were many of those stories. And so if you think about my trajectory, I thought I was living my best life. I thought I was fulfilling my sense of purpose, identity, being a physician until I burned out and realized that it didn't fit me as well as I thought it should. And so I was lucky enough to be financially independent. I had saved and invested enough money, I could start pulling away from medicine. But the piece of medicine that I didn't want to pull away from was being a hospice doctor. And while I was doing that and spending more time being a hospice doctor, I started listening to my hospice patient stories. And I was really impressed at how a number of them had realized that there were these things that they wish they had done in life, these things that they regretted not doing. And yet, now they were finding themselves terminally ill and they were afraid that they didn't have enough time to realize those things. That was part of it. And then I was also really impressed with people who had taken the time to do things that were deeply important to them and finding how peaceful they were as the end of life came. A person I mention in my book, his name was Ernesto. Ernesto had a dream of climbing Mount Everest and in fact left his job in his mid-20s in order to take a sabbatical right in the middle of being in corporate America, the time when he was really building his career and making the most. And people thought he was crazy, but he took a year off to go climb Mount Everest. He trained for half the year. He eventually went there, 
Um, unfortunately, the weather changed and he got about halfway up and had to turn back. But when I took care of him in his 40s and he was dying of leukemia, I was impressed by how important that attempt at climbing Mount Everest, even in his last days, was to him. He would regale us with questions or I'm sorry, he would regale us with stories about his climb. And I realized that those things that are important to us, if we don't take the time and do them and start doing more purposeful things earlier, uh, life may pass us by and we may find ourselves on our deathbeds and having not accomplished that, which we were hoping we could. You know, um, your book really resonated with me because uh, a few weeks ago I went to visit my grandfather. He's dying of cancer right now, right? So I've, um, I've only met him twice in my life. I met him when I was 18 and, and recently. And he spent a total of 24 years of his life in prison. So when I went to visit him in Wichita, of all places, um, I really couldn't ask him anything like too deep, too serious, because he didn't have that much energy. And um, the biggest thing I got from him was just like he looked like me. He had my demeanor. And um, it's just it's, it's wild that he made the decisions he made that impacted his life in this way. And two years ago, I asked him, I said, hey, you know, because he had he was diagnosed with cancer. I asked him two years ago, I was like, hey, um, is there anything you wish you would have done differently in your life? He mentioned he wished that he would have been good, but he treated people better. He said, I mm -hmm. wish I treated God's people better. Um, I wish that I got an education in business like I wanted to. I wish I learned how to play an instrument. And um, he wished that he would have fought tooth and nail to spend more time with his family and his children. And basically what I'm wondering, have you ever, most of the people in your example, in your book, like we're, we're all told that we have to get an education. We have to get in a career. We have to make money. We have to basically get the White House and the picket fist, things like that. Have you ever dealt with a patient that um, lived a hard, very hard life, you know, um, didn't necessarily go the, the, the standard route through life? And um, did, their, did their regrets match up with the same regrets that people who actually were more career oriented? Interestingly enough, people's regrets are very individual, right? So what people regret really depends on who they are. Mm -hmm. Where the similarity is, is the theme. As people regret that they never had the energy, courage, or time to do the things that were important to them. So for some people, that is education. I never went after that degree. For some people, it's a skill or an accomplishment. I never wrote that book. For other people, it's that I never fixed that relationship that went awry those things are individual because for all of us, purpose tends to be individual. But the theme is that we didn't concentrate on those things that were essentially deeply important to us. Uh, different people, different things are deeply important. Your life experience is going to shade that in different ways, right? What becomes mm -hmm. important to you is going to be different depending what your lived experiences are. But in general, People who took the time and tried to pursue those important things before they got to the end of life tend to be more peaceful while they're on their deathbeds than people who never had the courage to try and to go after what was really important to them. Not what society said that was important to them, not what they needed to do to make enough money to live, but the things that really actually spoke to their soul. I'm wondering, um, like when it comes to self-actualization, um, how important are goals when it comes to self-actualizing? The reason I ask you this is because I have plenty of friends. I've had plenty of uh, I met plenty of people. They have goals in their life, such as, you know, the goal to lose weight. But then two years go by and they still haven't lost the weight. So obviously the goal isn't a real goal. And there isn't the schedule has not been put in place actually for them to actually achieve that goal. Um, how how can people how important are goals when it comes to self-actualizing and how can people actually find goals that are going to help them go to the direction to become their best selves. So in a lot of ways, when we talk about self-actualization, we're looking right at the top of Maslow's pyramid. And I make the argument in the book that maybe we should flatten that. But the point being is we look at this place of what we would call enlightenment. I like to call it having a sense of purpose, identity, and connections so when it comes to self-actualization or even purpose, identity, and connection, specifically purpose, I think we actually make a mistake on focusing on goals. And the reason why is often goals are a little bit out of our control, right? We might get to that goal, but we also might not. And a lot of the times 
we're not necessarily under control whether we do or not. We know how hard we work towards something. We know about having the right intentions. Those are all things we can control. But for instance, my goal might be that for my podcast, Earn and Invest, I get a million downloads a month. That may or may happen, may or may not happen, but some of that is out of my control. So I think a big thing is actually to move away from goals and start looking at purpose as the processes. Like how are we going to fill our lives with things we enjoy doing where we enjoy doing the thing regardless of the end goal. So for instance, if you're going to talk about weight loss, we can look at a weight loss goal of 50 pounds. You know, that's good or bad and you might hit it and you might not. And maybe your physiology or metabolism just won't support that. Maybe that's not reachable. But what if instead we start talking about what's really purposeful and important, which is the process of being healthy? Right. So if the process is being healthy, what can I do to make myself more healthy? Well, I can exercise. Right. Maybe I can find exercise I enjoy so I can enjoy the process of doing this. Maybe I can start looking at eating better and maybe to do that, I'll start cooking and maybe I'll like cooking, maybe cooking something healthy. So what if we focus on the process of being healthy as opposed to the goal of weight loss? Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot more under our control. And I think happiness more lies there than setting up these goals that we might or might not reach. Now, part of, I think, also self-actualization or happiness in the book, I call this the climb, right? It's focusing on things where you can enjoy the process, but it's also this possibility of incremental gain. So I don't know if I'm going to lose 50 pounds, but maybe I'll lose a pound here or two. Maybe I won't lose any weight, but I'll get my body fat down a percentage or two. Like those are things that I probably can really control and I can work towards improving. Whereas whether I lose that 50 pounds or not, I might, and it might just not be possible for me. You know, as you were talking, it made me think of uh, something I've always told myself was whenever I saw a woman that I was really attracted to, you know, I always pushed myself to speak to her because I did not want to regret not not attempting it because it, she would take over my mind. I would think about her way too much. So it's better to just take that risk and then see what happens. When it comes to finding your purpose, I hear so many guys on the Internet that there there's people who preach, oh, you know, you want to live your purpose. You want to find your purpose. And there's so many young men that come in like, I don't know how to find my purpose. How do I go about doing that? Like question I have for you. Are you currently living your purpose? Are you living your best, best life at this moment? And if so, um, how does that look for you? So as, as I mentioned before in the book, I talk about the climb. So what is purpose? Purpose are things in which we enjoy the process, not necessarily the product or goal, and things that we feel like we can incrementally improve at. And so I think in order to reach that idea of self-actualization, we actually want to have as many climbs as possible in our life, or at least enough to keep us busy. We hope eventually we can replace the time we spend doing things we don't like, whether that be things we're forced to do or whether that be jobs, and start replacing more of that time with these climbs. So you ask me, have I kind of started to live my purpose? In a lot of ways, I have. And I was lucky enough to get my finances in order so I could start subtracting out the things in my life I didn't like doing, right? So there were parts of my job I didn't like doing. I started subtracting those out. There were things around the house and in the yard I didn't like doing. So if I could, I hired some of those out. And so that left me a lot of space and time to start then building in things that were purposeful for me. So I went from being a full-time doctor to doing only hospice work. The one part of being a doctor I really enjoyed. So that was purposeful for me. And that was taking up about 10 hours of my week. But then I said, well, what types of things, what type of climbs can I get involved with that I can start doing during the rest of that time? So one of those things, for instance, was podcasting. So I knew I loved communication. I know that getting behind a mic and making a podcast episode, regardless of how many people listen to it, so getting rid of the goal and focusing on the process of sitting behind a microphone and interviewing people is so joyful for me that I can now fill some of my time, some of that week doing this. So I only work as a doctor 10 hours a week, but I work as a podcaster about 20, 25 hours a week. I don't really do that to make money. I do that because that's part of my purpose. That's part of my climb. Now add in other things you enjoy and I have, and you start really building a life 
around this idea of purpose. So I love to exercise. So I exercise a good hour to a day. I love to read. I read an hour to a day. And then, of course, I have kids who are teenagers now. But when I started all this, they were younger. So I'm there when my kids go to school and I'm there when they get home. So all of these things start building out this idea of purpose and my goal, part of the idea of becoming financially independent, but my goal in general was how do I replace things that don't feel purposeful in my life and start filling that time in more and more with things that are. So I very much at this time in life feel like I'm living a very purposeful life because the truth of the matter is almost everything I do nowadays is because I choose to do it. Yeah. Most mornings I can wake up and I can say, you know what, I'm not going to do that today and I can just cancel it. And there's no one who can tell me not to. And so that feels very purposeful to me. Yeah, it's lovely. It gives you freedom to come yeah, and, and go as you please. And I have, hard, I have hard days. And in fact, I have things on my schedule that sometimes I dread. But you know what? I put every single one of those things there and I did it because it fulfilled some need for me that I thought was worthwhile. So there's occasionally when I have to do something for the podcast, like edit it. And I'm kind of like, boy, I don't feel like sitting down and editing this podcast today, Yeah. Uh, but that was my choosing. And if I decided at some point I don't want to do it, then I don't do it. And that's kind of that ultimate control. I feel you. I feel you. Um, I, I love that response. In your book, you mentioned that your family, your parents, taught you good financial habits during your childhood, which helped you be, reach financial freedom. I want to say in your 30s, late 30s. Yeah, late 30s. What are those financial habits that they taught you growing up? So first and foremost, you know, I'm the first one to admit I was born into a middle class family with professional parents, right? Well-educated professional parents. So I definitely won the kind of lottery, I think, for birth lottery. Like I had safety. I had education. I had everything on my side, but I get got to watch them operate. And so they modeled this wonderful behavior for me. So what did they model? My parents generally saved much more than they spent. In fact, I think for most years of my childhood, even in their high earning years, uh, they saved 50% or more of the, what they brought in. They didn't spend frivolously in general. They tended to buy things that they needed. They certainly spent on enjoyment, but they didn't go overboard with it. They invested in real estate. My parents owned a number of rental properties. They invested in the stock market. So I, I used to remember my stepdad sitting there with the newspaper back in the day when you had to look at the newspaper for your stock quotes. Um, I learned about entrepreneurship. My parents were both entrepreneurs. They owned their own businesses. So all of these great financial habits, I learned just by watching them. My parents never put anything on credit card that they couldn't pay off immediately. They never really went into major debt. If they ever went into some kind of debt, it was leverage for buying property or something like that. So they just, they kind of showed me all these great financial habits that then I did the same that they did when I was growing up and when I became a young adult. And I had no idea what I was doing, but because they invested in the stock market, I invested in the stock market because they mm -hmm. save 50% or greater of their income. I save 50% of my income because they bought real estate properties. I owned rental real estate properties. I, I actually had no idea what I was doing. I was just doing what they did because that's what I thought everybody did. You had a good model. You had good role models. Yeah. Wonderful modeling. That's awesome. What I want to know, I want to know how the younger Jordan was, because you mentioned that your father died of an aneurysm. And I could, well, I could kind of relate to that. Um, when I was nine years old, my mother had an aneurysm. Hmm. And um, for people who don't know what an aneurysm looks like, it's like my mother, like her entire body has shut down. Like she just dropped and, you know, your body, like it, it lets go all its waste, you know, everything. And um, she had to get brain surgery and um, she ended up living. But when I looked up, read up on it later, and um, I realized that most people don't don't live through an aneurysm, you know, so I was really lucky as a child to have that. And I remember my mother just sitting in the room knitting like they gave her knits or something, gave her like yarn or something. She had to knit and keep putting together um, uh, like sweaters and things like that. I'm not sure what's that what that is for. Do you does that sound familiar to you? Have you ever dealt with uh, patients who had aneurysms and survived and had to do patterns? So it is exactly as you say, an aneurysm is a ballooning and burst blood vessel. And when you get them in the brain, it's often fatal. And the reason why is usually you don't get any symptoms until you get a bad headache. And then it's a short period of time before it bursts. And when it bursts, 
the brain is a contained space. So the blood in the brain space increases the pressure and causes people to die fairly quickly. So very few people survive. The people who do survive, of course, are going to get some deficits from this. So when you're talking about knitting and those kind of things, it's part of occupational and physical therapy that they actually give them fine motor movements and things to help improve their function of their motor skills related to the brain, right? Because the brain has to give mm -hmm. the messages to the spinal cord and the spinal cord sends the messages to the fingers and then the fingers move and do things. So what you're describing makes a lot of sense. And yeah, you know, it's bad luck. We, we, I often say we, we tell the stories about our lives. If we're lucky, we tell ourselves the stories about our lives that not just make it bearable, but make it magical. Right. Mm. So I was a little kid and my dad died and it made no sense. He was out there functioning, doing fine. And then the next moment he was gone. An unhappy me probably would have looked back at my life and said, I was a victim and used that to explain everything that went wrong in my life. I've been lucky enough instead to look back at the story of my life and feel more like a hero and say that this was something I had to struggle with, but it built me into a thoughtful person who eventually became a doctor like him, who had empathy for other people in these situations and learned a sense of introspection and an ability to function and grow even in these kind of circumstances. So it's all about how we look at our lives. And I've been lucky enough to be in a good enough place to tell that heroic story of my own childhood so that when I look to the future, I don't see a future that's scary or worrisome. I look at a future where my father could die and I still turned out okay. In fact, I turned out well. So God knows what the future is going to hold. How has your experience with your father impacted your relationship with your children? It definitely has made me cognizant of this idea that your time on this earth is limited and somewhat uncontrollable, right? So mm -hmm. I've taken a lot of time to try to be in the moment with my children and realize that those moments are gifts and I may not have them forever. I may not get that many of them. But I've also been really thoughtful about talking to my children and saying things like, my dad when I was died when I was little, I want you to know, God forbid if something happened to me, you will be okay. And I want you to go on with your life. And I want you to have a magical life the way I've had a magical life, even though my father passed away. And so I try to really give them those messages and connect with them on that level and take my experience and help explain to them the world that I now see and see some of that beauty in that world. And so I want to make sure that God forbid that happens to me because it could happen to me if it could happen to my dad, that they'll be okay, that yeah. they also will look at their childhood heroically and that'll boost them into a wonderful life. Have, are you teaching your children the same financial habits? Like, are they buying property right now? Or are they making <laughs> investments at this point? They're like, cause they're 14 they're teenagers now. Yeah. So my son is 18. My daughter is 15. My son actually edits my financial podcast. So he gets to hear all of these things. What I really try to do is, so I feel like there are three ways to really teach your children about money, right? One is to didactically teach them, which is sit them down and explain to them what compounding is and show them how you invest, et cetera. And I don't do very much of that. And I actually don't think it's the most successful way to teach your children. But the okay. other two ways are really important. One is modeling. So I, I make sure that they see me navigating my financial world and can be a spectator to that navigation. They see mm. me investing. I discuss with them problems I have with tenants. I talk to them about the stock market. I've talked to them about financial decisions when it comes to career. I've talked to them about this idea of financial independence. But more important than talking, I want them to see me living that life. That's that modeling that my parents did for me. The other thing that is experiential learning, and I think if you're careful with your kids, you can give them the chance to experience financial behaviors in a safe way in which they can't hurt themselves, right? So for instance, with our kids, we decided when they were really little to give them a yearly allowance and we would give it to them on January 1st. So instead of giving them, let's say $10 a week, we'd give them $520 on January 1st and say, here's what you're responsible for buying throughout the year. Here's your money. You have to manage it. We're not giving you any more for the year. So compare and contrast that to someone who gets no 
experiential financial learning, but then ends up in college and gets their first credit card. And they go and they use that credit card in a really irresponsible way. Well, that mm -hmm. young person in college could really damage themselves, their credit score, really you know, end up in bad debt by screwing up with that first credit card. But my kid, if I give him $520 for the year and he makes a bad decision and has nothing mid-year, the stakes are really low. So the goal too with my children is A, to model good financial behavior for them to see me and my wife doing these responsible financial things. And then the other is to give them a little space to experience money and fall on their face and be okay. And if I can do both of those things, the didactic learning, hopefully they pick up somewhat from me, somewhat from school, somewhat from the school of hard knocks. Man, that's really good. That's really good advice. I'm taking some of that advice myself, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you mentioned that you grew up in a really good financial situation. Yeah. For the people who are not in the best financial situation, whether that was by birth or because they made bad mistakes with credit cards or something like that, what, what is the first thing that person should do to actually improve their financial situation? You know, it's interesting. And, and really one of the things I try to talk about in this book is even before they think of their financial situation, whether well off or not well off, you really want to do some of this purpose work. And the reason why is you want to understand what your sense of purpose looks like in order to buy, in order to develop a financial future, a financial framework around it. Once you connect with what purpose looks like to you, then you can take a clear eyed look at your finances and start building that financial framework to support your sense of purpose. So it really depends. Like I said, I came from a really privileged financial background, but not everyone does. But depending on what purpose looks like in your life, you can then start taking really positive steps with your finances to do what you want to do. So the question is, what should those steps be? Well, it really depends on what's purposeful and important for you. But I'll tell you, Personal finance advice for rich people is the same as personal finance advice for poor people, right? Earn as much as you can, spend comfortably, but as little as you can, try to create a gap there and take that gap and invest it one way or another. And that's always going to be the advice and how to make your finances better. But again, you could have someone who has a lot of debt and you could be in your 20s and I'm going to ask you, well, what feels purposeful to you? And then we're going to look at your job, right? And one of the things we're going to say is, is your job feel good and purposeful? If the answer is yes, then the answer might be, let's work within that job to try to create more income. But in a sense, we've already created a financial independence for you, even though you're in debt. And the reason why we've created financial independence is you are spending your time doing something purposeful that you love doing. Let's now work your finances around to get rid of some of that debt and create a little bit of margin in your, in your space and your time. Now, that's very different than someone who's 22 years old, has zero dollars to their name. They can't find a job doing what they want to do and are working the nine to five, which they hate. And so I'm going to give much different advice to that person. I'm going to say, look, you've got very little money. Money is an important tool, but it's not the only tool. You've also got your youth. You're not married yet. You don't have a mortgage. So why don't you work that nine to five, even though you don't like it, because that's going to put enough money you know, in the bank account to put food on the table. But let's every night between seven and nine o'clock have you work on a passion project, something that feels purposeful and important to you, but that also may make some money. And let's do that for six months and see what happens. If you do that for six months and you happen to make a little money, and then you can say, you know what, I'm going to start doing that nine to five only Monday through Thursday, or maybe I'm going to make it a 10 to four instead of a nine to five, because I make a little money doing this purposeful thing that I've been using my tool of energy and time to do for the last six months. Great. And you can start whittling away and start filling more of your time with that purposeful side hustle kind of thing you like doing. And maybe you can draw away from that thing you don't like doing, which is the nine to five. Let's say, on the other hand, you do this for six months and you make zero extra money. Well, you can't get rid of that nine to five. But guess what? From seven to nine every night or nine to 11 every night, you spent two hours doing something you like doing that was purposeful. It didn't make you extra money, but you've at least now fulfilled some of your time with purpose and things that are exciting to you. 
And so I don't think you can lose there. But the idea is that advice is a little different depending on the person. But privilege, especially the way I was talking about it, were the privileges of education and the privileges of having a stable financial background. But remember, those are just two tools. There are some other tools there. There's mm. your communities. There's your age. There's your connections. We have other. There's your skills and abilities. So for those people who aren't as privileged as I am, they might have to focus on some of those other tools they have until they can build up some of that really powerful tool, which happens to be money. Man, you know, you just taught me something. I had a, a conversation with one, of my, with one of my best friends about a week or so ago, and um, he, he, he gave, we were speaking on the phone, and he basically had told me that, you know, a lot of our social group, they have been comparing themselves to me, and a lot of them can't, got jealous. And I was telling him, like, you know, I think I told him the wrong thing, basically. I told him that the thing is people don't have real goals. But the thing that I really had that kept me so focused, you know, over time was I had purpose. I had purpose since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to play professional football. So I got the furthest I got was play college ball, um, had a few professional workouts. It didn't work out. But following that purpose and going for it, it opened up so many other doors for me. And I met so many people and I've grown um, I become, I'm honestly like the people who grew up with me, they wouldn't even recognize who I am right now. Yeah. So it's just funny how purpose can change your life. And then also me even starting a business and doing what I'm doing now, I always told myself as a kid, you know, I want to be a great father. I wanted to uh, be at the house with my children. And it's funny. That's what you're doing now. You're, you, you said your yeah. kids, they, you're at home when they go to school and you're home when they come back home from school. That's what my purpose was growing up. So it always kept me focused. Um, what I want to what I want to ask you was, when it comes to when it comes to like finding your purpose, like how what advice would you give to people when it comes to actually finding their purpose? Because I think when you find your purpose, that's going to help, and it's a real purpose. It helps organize every other area of your life. Yeah, I want to say before I, I I'm going to say some very specific things about how you find your purpose. But before I do, I, I think something you said is really important there. When you are intentional and living authentically in a sense of purpose, like you were, for instance, about football, you know who you are. So you really get that strong sense of identity and purpose and identity lead to connections and community. And that's the magical part. Like, again, we focus on money and did you become that football player in the NFL? No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. But by living authentically in your purpose, you created community connections and skills and yeah. those things led you to a life where you could continue following that purpose, not maybe the exact same purpose, mm. but that community and connections were actually the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It isn't purpose and it isn't even knowing your identity. The pot of gold really is what flows from that, which is those communities and connections which lead to a full life, right? That's, that's kind of what we wake up for. So the big question then is, how do we find our purpose? Well, I can give you several answers to that. One of the ways I talk about in the book is with dying patients, we do what's called a life review, right? That's a structured series of questions where people look back at their life and we ask them questions like, what was important to you when you were younger? What were some of your goals? What were your best accomplishments? What were your biggest failures? Who were the important people in your life? What do you want to accomplish before you die? So this is called the life review. And actually, one of the great ways to start looking at what is my purpose today is to do your own life review, but not because you're a dying patient, but because you're reviewing your life and trying to figure out what's important to you. And in fact, a really simple version of the life review is the one sentencer. And I always say, ask yourself, if I found out I was dying in the next six months, what would I always regret never having the energy or courage or time to do? And if you really kind of ponder that and work through that statement and become real thoughtful on it, you can start harking to this idea of what is purposeful in my life. That is one way. But there are so many other ways to really start thinking about what your purpose is. One of the things I often tell people is look at your childhood. What got you really excited as a kid before you worried about money, before society told you you could or couldn't do things? What did you really dig as a kid? Believe it or not, as adults, when we finally have the space and time, a lot of us go back to our passions of childhood. So that's one thing is to look at your childhood and what you love there. Another is to look at your job. Even if you hate your job, and this really worked for me, 
what is the one thing you really love about your job, even if you don't love your job in general? For me, that was hospice work. So I realized quickly that helping the dying and terminally ill was part of my purpose, even though this whole idea of being a doctor no longer felt like part of my purpose. So another thing to do is look at your job today and is there any piece of it that you really love, even if you don't like the whole job? Another one, a question I love asking people is, when is the last time you woke up in the middle of the night excited by an idea and you couldn't fall back asleep? And so what happens when that happens? A lot of times you wake up the next morning tired, you've got work to go to, you put it somewhere in the back of your mind and you never think about it again. But often those are the whisperings of purpose. Like what are the things that really rile me up? Ask other people, mm -hmm. talk to your family and friends, ask them the specific question. When do I appear most alive to you? And what am I doing at that time? So these are all lots of little threads that we can pull on to start saying, okay, what feels like purpose to me? And guess what? If none of that works, then you can use the spaghetti method, which is throw a bunch of spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. What that means is you say yes to a lot of new experiences, ones that maybe even scare you. And after each one, you evaluate it and say, how did that feel while I was doing it? Did it feel mm. good? Do I want to do that again? Do I feel excited about the prospect of moving forward and learning more about that? And so try enough new things and eventually you'll find some that you like. You know, my profession is software development. And um, I remember once I finished playing football, the first thing I did was is I um, two things I did. I actually I bought a guitar. Mm -hmm. So I taught myself how to play guitar and I took classical courses. And uh, the next thing I did is I bought a MacBook and um, a Swift book. I love to code and I love music. And when I was learning, when I was coding and building apps and staying up all night, thinking about the applications, waking up in the morning, trying to figure out how to solve these, these little issues that, um, that would last forever. Um, I didn't realize when I was doing that, that I can actually get paid to code. So <laughs> coding for years and had no idea that coding was associated with software development and um just listening to you i've always followed my followed my heart you know yeah. um, i've had friends that have asked me like how do you stay so focused and i was like i just do what i want to do i didn't understand it but you kind of are putting things in in order for me so i can see like now i always follow my heart i was following my purpose yeah. at all times and that just opened doors for me you know and helped me do the things that i'm doing today. And, and when you say you were following your heart, you know what you're really saying, especially when it comes to things like coding, is you were doing what felt good regardless of the outcome, right? Yeah. You weren't like, I'm going to become a master coder and make a billion dollars and change the world. You were like, this is an interesting problem to me. I'm going to sit down in front of the computer and figure this out. And that was joyful for you. So again, this idea of process, like what lights us up while we're doing it? I love goals. And I think goals are fine, but I think if you hang your sense of purpose on a goal, unless that goal is really 100% achievable and under your control, you're also setting yourself up for a little bit of what's called purpose anxiety. And purpose anxiety is exceedingly common and actually makes people feel really bad. I hear you. You mentioned um, like working with the dying. Can you give me the top five regrets that... Um, all the people who realized they were dying had. So Bronnie Ware wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And actually, she is a hospice palliative care nurse and okay. interviewed, right? Hundreds and hundreds of people that had were going through terminal illness. And so in my book, I reference Bronnie Ware's Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Going through them all, I, I didn't, haven't memorized them off the top of my head, but basically... The basic regrets are that I didn't have the courage to be myself and do those things that were important to me and connect to those people who were important to me. Like, that's really what it is. And again, this gets back to this whole idea of being your authentic self and pursuing those things that were deeply important to you, as opposed to doing what society wanted you to do or chasing money or chasing career, or chasing all those things that you thought that were important versus the things that authentically lit you up. You know, in your book, you mentioned something. I actually, I listened to this part of the audiobook a few different times, but you mentioned the three brothers. Yes. And, the, and I know for a fact that I'm the first brother. I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the, the, the older one that's always focused. He doesn't try to enjoy the road. He's just like, I have to get there no matter what. You know, things will be better once I get there, which isn't always true. 
the question I have for you is, how do you find a good balance? How do you find a balance between going for the things that you really want to go for in life, living the life that you really, that, that's purposeful to you, and then also balancing out your responsibilities and um, your financial needs? So here's what I really like to do when framing this question is I like to frame it around finances because we all face this problem with this idea that I want to save enough money so I can retire and have enough to live the life I want to live till I die. And yet we also want to live well today and spend money on things that make us happy today because a, we don't know how long we're going to live. You could be like my father and die at the age of 40. And B, what's the sense of living a life if you don't enjoy it now and are always putting it off for the future? So what I always tell people when it comes to trying to figure out this kind of YOLO, you only live once, let's enjoy life today versus deferred gratification, let's put it off as long as we can for retirement or some big gain in the future I always tell people that we have to ask ourselves a very specific question. And that question is, what scares you most? This idea that I'm going to die young and never enjoy myself or enjoy my wealth, or this idea that I'm going to live till I'm old and run out of money. And if you can ask yourself what scares you most, then you can start looking at that continuum between YOLO and deferred gratification and deciding how much time to spend or money to spend now doing those things, what you want to do versus shall we put them off towards later? And so a good example of this is my father, who died at the age of 40, actually had an inkling that he was going to die young. In fact, he told my mom, he's like, I'm afraid I'm going to die young when he married her. So my dad didn't put off a lot of things towards retirement. He mm. didn't defer gratification as much. He didn't save a huge amount for when he was going to be old and gray. Instead, he lived very much in the moment. He traveled a lot. He loved photography. He got offered a lucrative job in oncology. He was a cancer doctor. But instead of doing that, he went and worked at the VA hospital where he could work his own hours and didn't have to work nearly as much. But it was a huge pay cut. But he had this inkling that he wasn't going to live a long time. So if you're someone like my father and you're saying, I'm going to make $100,000 a year and 50,000 of it's going to go to everything I need to pay that I have no choice about. That's going to leave me 50,000 left over. If you're someone like my father, you don't save that 50,000 for retirement. Maybe you save 10,000 for retirement and you take that 40,000 and you live a good life right now. And so if you are right and you die young, then you kind of used your wealth to live as well as you could. If you're wrong, and you live to 80 or 90, well, it's true. You're not going to retire early because you've only been saving up $10,000 a year, but you're living a great life today. I mean, you're doing the YOLO thing. You're taking great vacations. You're living it up. So that's the idea. You kind of have to ask yourself that question, what scares you most? And it works the other way around too. If you're more worried about dying old and broke, then instead of saving $10,000 and spending $40,000, you are going to spend $10,000, enjoy yourself a little bit now, but save that $40,000 for retirement. If you are right and you live a long time, you're going to have so much money saved up, you're going to be able to retire early and do whatever the heck you want. Hmm. If you're wrong, I guess that's the only bad situation. You die young, but at least you were spending some of your money to do what you want and you had all those dreams which propelled you. You just didn't realize you were going to die young. And, you know, um, it's funny. Um, I ran into one of my uh, teammates at the airport a week ago on my way to Chicago. And um, I haven't seen him in years. And he was with uh, some 18-year-old college football prospects. He was going to show them around uh, different schools in Utah. And um, when I spoke to these kids, I, you know, I gave them advice. But the biggest thing I told them, I was like, man, you know, when I was playing football, I was so serious about what I wanted to do that I didn't invest a lot of time into the relationships I had with my teammates. I had been in sports since I was four years old. So I really didn't, that was my world. You know, I thought all people thought like athletes. And um, once I got into the real world, you know, it wasn't the football that I missed. It wasn't, you know, playing a sport specifically or the working out. It was the, my teammates, the locker room conversations. You know, I only went to about three college football parties when I was in college. I wish I went to more. You know, I wish I would have did things with them and traveled and had closer relationships with um, 
most of my teammates. That's definitely, um, like you said, like relationships, they're, they're, they're very important, a lot more important than people um, than realize. And I also told him this. I said, man, you know, I know you're, you're the athlete. You're the top guys on campus. You're going to get a lot of female attention. I said, have your fun. But I said, it's really important to get to know some people as well. You know, I wish that I've got to know, befriended someone. I was like, you, you really should invest in that. I promise you, when you look back, you live in the real world, dealing with real world issues, you're going to wish that you, you know, actually got to know somebody on a very deep level. You know, um, I'm wondering what I have for you. Um, wondering what is the best investment that you've made in your life? Hmm. The best investment that I made in my life, I have to say, we'll see if this answers it the way you want to, but I'd have to say the best investment I've ever made in my life is I started writing. Like I found that writing for me, whether it be journaling or blogging or what have you, is probably one of the best ways to work through what's going on in your life and is one of the best ways to start clarifying who you are and who you want to be. And so I invested in personal reflection and writing, and I think that has continuously served me throughout my life. Whenever anything big happens in my life, I end up writing about it. And often that becomes not just a place to explore my ideas, but it also becomes the playbook for me to start taking action and carrying out those things that started as ideas, but eventually become life changes. You know, do you know, you know, are you familiar with Tupac? Everybody is. Are yes. You? Yep, yeah. Of course. Tupac has a song called lost souls. Right. And um, I'm just thinking as you're speaking, like what, like what is it about life and um, living that makes people get lost in life because as somebody who's always been focused and uh, goal oriented and, you know, always striving to do things. When I would see friends like mine having fun, going to parties or doing other things, you know, um, I always thought that they were living like what felt good to them. But, you know, as years go by and people get in the real world, like some people feel lost in life. Like how does, how do you think that really happens to people? I mean, I think there's a huge tension in all these voices that start as you're a little kid telling you who and what you're supposed to be, and then that inner voice that's really telling you who and what you want to be. And I think for most of us, that inner voice doesn't necessarily agree with what we hear out in the world from our parents and society and Instagram and all those places that are, are – and marketing, right? We have all of these marketing structures – these commercials and these ads, they're telling us how we want to be, who we want to be, what we want to look like, what we want to sound like. They're doing this because they want to sell us things. But the mental messages we're really getting is this is how to be what we're supposed to be. But I don't think that necessarily tracks with what we feel inside. For you, what you felt inside is I want to be a football player, right? For me, it was I want to have these deep conversations. I want to write. I want to public speak. I want to I want to make a difference in the world. But what society was telling me is you need to be like your father. You should be a doctor. You'll make a lot of money. You'll get a lot of respect. That's what you should be doing. And so I think that's why most of us feel lost because all these messages we're getting from the outside don't necessarily connect with what we really want when it comes to purpose and identity on the inside. And most people are really struggling not to listen to those messages and to start listening more deeply to who and what they want to be. But most of us fail at it. And this is why we have regrets of the dying. This is, yeah. this is why people on their deathbeds start saying, man, I wish I had done that. Yeah. And the reason why is there's all these forces pushing us away from listening to our internal voice and intuition, which is saying, boy, you really love this. Why not do more of it? Yeah. It's... Um... You're right. Like our parents, the educational system, they teach us how we're supposed to be, who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to speak. You know what a high quality, well, mature, fully mature uh, male looks like. 
And um, when we graduate from school and we get in the real world, some of us just can't adjust because our whole lives we've had our parents give us a schedule, tell us what to do, or we have, we've had teachers that have given us a schedule and told us what to do. We got our validation from grades, you know, and the opinions and other, of others. And then once you get into the real world, it's kind of like, now you have to build your life. You have to create your schedule. And most people, I mean, once you went through that route, you basically, for like the first 22 years of your life, you've had people guiding you <laughs> along that route, you know? So I guess I can yeah. see how people get dazed and confused. Listen, if that. you have kids, especially if you have had more than one kid, you know, most like two and three year olds are laughing and playing and seem so happy. What changes? Why are kids so joyous and adults by the time you hit like seven or eight, man, you don't act that way anymore. Like that joy, the giggling, the playing, the silliness, it all starts getting moderated over time. I think we lose that connection to our joy and our passion. And um, I think it's a hundred percent society. It's, it's, and it's not just our parents. I mean, our parents mean, well, they try to tell us what they think we should be, but Again, it's all these messages. It's the TV. It's the marketing. It's the ads. It's all these third parties out there that have even ulterior motives for giving us these images. It even goes into our relationships, our romantic relationships. Yeah. You know, you guys look good together. Um, oh, you, you guys would make a perfect couple. You know, you'll, you'll align yourself with certain people just because of the opinions of others. You know, yeah. it's, it's, and that yeah, becomes yeah. purpose. And so what happens is a lot of us purpose becomes fulfilling these societal roles or these Instagram pictures or these views that have been grained in us since we started watching TV and listening to radio and listening to our parents and hearing our teachers. And so we struggle, struggle, struggle to create an internal image that meets that external image. But that also creates conflict because Ultimately, I don't think our internal image actually wants to be those things, mm -hmm. right? So we're trying, trying to, trying to change out of who we are into something we think we're supposed to be. Whereas I think true happiness might be more embracing who we actually are. You know, I know the Bible says something like be childlike. Mm -hmm. A few years back, I've always, I'm very active. And um, when I would go running, I felt like, well, I'll say about five years ago, five years five years ago or a little bit longer than that, um, I would feel like this weight on my shoulders when I would go running and then I would keep going and I would just imagine that my younger self was talking to me in my younger self voice and speaking the way that my younger self used to speak. Horrible, horrible vocabulary. I was real, had a dirty mouth when I was a kid, but I would imagine my younger self like telling me like, what are you, what are you doing, man? Keep going. What do you know? Push, push. And it's because I felt, I felt so, that's the best way to say this. I felt so weighed down by life's expectations and um, all the other, the being in that toxic work environment, so many other things that I was dealing with at that time. And I wasn't, it really wasn't until the last year or so that I realized that that voice that I had that I was speaking to was really my old, my younger self trying to reconnect with who I am today, because that was going to basically make me feel, um, make me feel full, make me feel better, give me my confidence, you know, give me the energy that I needed to, um, to keep going um it's, it's, it's crazy how that how that works um what could you explain the fire principle versus the yellow principle the fire principle versus the yolo principle okay so yeah. fire is financial independence retire early it has evolved quite a bit but the original fire especially the one that we really talked about in kind of the 2010 to 2015 2018 era was grind it out work as hard as possible, make as much money as you can, invest that money, and then get to a number, a net worth, which then would support you so much that you could stop working, never make another dollar in your life, and live off of the investments. Ultimate deferred gratification. Let's compare that to YOLO. YOLO is this idea of you only live once who knows when you're going to die? You could be like my dad and die young. So let's spend money like you only live once. Let's not miss out. Don't worry about the future. Live for today. They sound like opposite sides of the continuum. But the FIRE movement, the financial independence movement, has actually evolved. And we're starting to bring in more YOLO even into the financial independence movement. The idea is... 
if you build a solid financial structure, you don't necessarily have to retire early. You can retire regularly or at least retire later and therefore work a little bit less and maybe give yourself more time to YOLO today. So we're a lot more about lifestyle design than the original FIRE movement was about. And so I used to hate this idea of YOLO because I always would say, look, you've got a long future ahead. You've got these, you've got, you live many lives, not just one life. And there are all sorts of rebirths. I mean, when you start working, that's a new life. When you get married, that's a new life. When you have kids, yeah. that's a new life. And I hated YOLO because I wanted to say, look, God forbid, you don't want to be broke when you start one of these new lives, like having kids. You want to have enough money that you can enjoy yourself and be with them. But I'll tell you, Working with the dying changed some of this because they would have given any amount of money to just have one more experience. They mm -hmm. wanted a YOLO just one more time before they left this earth. So to me now, I'm, I'm trying to be more balanced, and I think we all can be more balanced, of trying to build a little YOLO into your life now as well as defer gratification taking some of your money and put it towards retirement and then taking some of your money and living in the moment and doing things that are deeply important that fulfill a sense of purpose today. And so I think we really have to try to do both. And that's, that's what lifestyle design really is. I remember when I first went to uh, Europe outside the football team, most of my friends were um, foreigners. And one of my good friends is from uh, Milano, Italy. Mm -hmm. And um, he told me to visit him when I was like 21, but it took me until the age of 30 to actually visit him because I told myself, like, I need to focus on football. I need to do this. I need to do that. And when I finally went out there and met with him and I was just like, man, you know, I wish I would have did this a lot earlier. I wish I would have did this sooner. You know, now we have way more responsibilities. We just got married, things like that. But I definitely once you once you have those goggles on, you know, um, and you're just what is it called? Like when you have a horse and you have like the blinders yeah, on blinders on yeah. Once you have those blinders on man and you're, and you're going forward. It's hard to see like all the things that are around you. What I want to have, what question I have for you right now is like, you talk about investing in your purpose, make your financial investments and what sequence should somebody prioritize their finances when it comes to investing in um, deciding whether they should invest in their purpose, you know, finances, et cetera. So, I mean, I think there's some basic things. As I always say, you need to understand your purpose better even before you look at your finances. But once you look at your finances, there is a hierarchy of things that you should probably start with. Like you should probably work on debt very early, right? You should work on an emergency fund. So even before you pay off your debt, you probably need an emergency fund. God forbid something bad happens. You have to go more in debt. So if you can you know, create an emergency fund of, you know, three to six months to cover your needs. That might be step one. Once you get your emergency fund, if you're working and you have something like a 401k match, putting enough money in your 401k to have your employer match it because that's free money, that might be step two. Step three might be then looking at debt, especially if you have a lot of debt or high interest debt, right? So if you have a lot of credit card debt or a lot of high interest debt, you want to start looking at paying some of that off first. Mm -hmm. But I think you can't do any of that if you're also not living at the same time, right? So if you're living so frugally that you do nothing you like and you're not enjoying anything, I think that's a mistake too. And that's why I think even when you're doing all these things, we have to take a small percentage of our money and use it to do things we enjoy as much as we can, right? There are cases when we have so little that we can't do that. But once you have a little buffer in your life, take some of those first financial steps Get yourself an emergency fund. Maybe do some of that 401k match. Start looking at debt. If you can get past that, start looking at some investments and things like that. But even when you're doing all that, make sure you budget a little bit for fun and experiences because, you know, if you feel like you're not living, how are you going to have all the energy to do all that hard stuff? Uh, this is the final question that I have for you. I'm wondering, when should somebody invest in love the reason i ask you this question is because i have i've had i've had interviews with dating coaches and one of the things that they told me is that they work with high high power men men who have great finances and they always put the the relationships on the back burner they they told themselves that hey i'm not ready for a relationship i have to focus on my business or i have to build my career up and i was one of those guys too like i had to focus on football I, there's no time to focus on a real relationship um and I, and I also conduct uh, surveys on my, um, my YouTube channel. And um, 
some guy I mentioned the last question I had was, do any of you guys have kids? And I can see based off of the comments that some people were saying like, oh, you know, I have time for family. I don't have time for that type of stuff right now because of this. But I know thinking that before and be where I'm at now, I know that that's a lie. <laughs> you know, you can definitely build with somebody. When should somebody, when do you think people should start prioritizing love and those romantic relationships and things like that? So some of it depends on how important love is to you, but I'm going to assume that relationships and love and connection is important to you. Mm. So this is the way I'd frame this. If you start investing when you're 20 years old, by the age of 50 or 60, you're going to have tons of money. Mm. If you start getting an education when you're, you know, if you go to college when you're 18 and then go to graduate school, et cetera, mm. when you're in forties and fifties, you're going to be a highly educated person. If you start practicing a skill when you're 20, you're going to be really good at that skill as you enter your thirties and forties and fifties, assuming you're not limited by age and those kind of things. What we're really talking about is compounding. So if you want a life full of love and connections and that kind of happiness, you got to start early because just like anything else, love and relationships and connections, they compound. It takes time. It takes a little energy and it takes a little investment. And so I don't think it's ever too early. I understand. Some people say I've got too many things going on in my life. It is not the season of my life to do that. And you know what? If you want to go build a business and you're 20 and you're like, I don't got time to have love because I'm going to be really successful and I'm really passionate and this business is really important to me. I say, go do that. But at least keep in the back of your mind that love also compounds. And the more love you start doing at a young age, the more that's going to blossom over the decades and ultimately, like I said, the goal of all of this, of all this is usually community and connections, which I include love and relationships and all those kind of things. So I would hate for you to take one of the things that is the most important, one of the things that is one of our true goals, one of the things that I truly believe relates to self-actualization. And I would hate to start late and not have as much compounding as you possibly could. Great answer. Jordan, thank you for your time. You've definitely helped clear out some things that I've, de I've had in my own mind, things that I've been dealing with. Um, specifically, I like how you replace goals with purpose because I'm not, it's, it's easy to tell somebody to have goals, you know, but that's not the, that's not really what drove me. What, what kept me going was really the, the fact that I had a purpose, which opened so many different doors. I met a lot of great people and it's helped me evolve into the man that I am today. So, Thank you for that. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the book. And if you have any cl closing words, you um, feel free to say them. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in any of the things we talked about, go to jordangrummet.com. You can find out about my book, Taking Stock, there, as well as the different ways in which I create content, including the Earn and Invest podcast. All right. Jordan, it was nice having you and um, have a good one. Thank you so much.